Hey everybody, welcome back to RPG Imaginings. I hope your holiday season has been well if you are celebrating a holiday during this time, and I wish everybody a Happy New Year uh, forthcoming. Uh, today is the third video and final video in our overview of Traveler Sector Construction Guide. And what I'm doing here uh, as part of this, this is a sponsored video by Mongoose Publishing. Thank you to Mongoose Publishing for sending me the Sector Construction Guide. This is a maker video series that I've been doing because, you know, one of the things that we all love to do with RPGs is build. And that isn't just limited to building characters. It's also limited to building, or it also can be expanded to include include building settings, building uh, political organizations, building situations. Uh, people who play role-playing games tend to love to build stuff. And so what I've done here is I've gathered together the colored pencils that I want for this time, and I will highlight for all of you which colored pencils that I'm using. Uh, in case you want to check out mechanical colored pencils. Um, this is something that I feature on my other channel, Clutch Situation. But for video three of our sector construction guide, we are going to be building the home world for the sector that we have been working on in this video series. And if I just move the book temporarily to the side, we started off the video series by taking a look at... Um, uh, the sector map as a whole. And what I in had intended to do here with Singularity Sector was to create two major polities in this sector of space called Singularity Sector, one of which is dominated by a black hole and then is separated by a region of space that I'm calling the Desolation that has the remnants of a supernova in it. And then that is separated from a set of Varger worlds uh, down here. And so this is the big picture of what is happening with the construction of the sector. And I've done normal things that one would do with a sector for Traveler. I've marked off which worlds have water, which worlds have gas giants, which worlds are lacking water. Um, and then when we zoom into this sect, subsector right here, this subsector is called the Omega subsector. And the idea behind the Omega subsector is that this is the primary subsector for one of the two polities that are defined on the major sector map. And I went through and I named every single one of the planets within this subsector. I indicated what class starports they have. I indicated whether or not they had gas giants and, of course, whether or not they were watery worlds or whether or not they were dry worlds. But one thing that I especially wanted to do was to highlight the essentially capital star system of this subsector, Transcendence. Because if we remember back to the polities that are involved here, and I'll just go ahead and go to the polity worksheet that we were working on here. Uh, this particular polity are Mapetti humans, the ones whose capital is Transcendence. And the idea here is that just like the Valani and other human species, uh, Darians, that had been transplanted to different worlds, um, the same is true of the Mapeti. They are physiologically very similar to Valani. They discovered jump drive several hundred years earlier than other Humanati major races, and they have reached the antimatter age, tech level 20 at this point. Uh, their culture is that they are a utopian league. They are dedicated towards personal betterment and acquisition of spiritual and scientific understanding, which connects up with their proximity to this black hole that is orbited by orbit is the wrong word that is surrounded by hexes that are restricted, but that still contain class A starports because Mapetti humans are very much dedicated, um, much of their scientific and spiritual investigation to the black hole itself, the Omega black hole. Okay. So, Mapetti population is concentrated around the Omega singularity and Omega subsector. 
Uh, history is that they are another group of humanity that were seeded by the ancients. They do not have a military. That doesn't mean that they're incapable of defending themselves. They've basically just been trained from birth on empathy and uh, psychology, and they may appear to outsiders as practically precognitive. But in reality, what is going on here is that they have just been heavily trained in psychology. Their ship singularity tech also functions well as defense against typical military weapons that are present, let's say, for argument in the Imperium. So all Mapedi start with Sosh plus four. They welcome visitors and are aware of the Zodani, which in relation to other regions of space, uh, this sector, the singularity sector, is located um, rimward from the Zodani consulate, which will be located up here in the, the galaxy map. And uh, they have first, they've had first contact with many soft fonts, but do not have any ex exploratory drive to travel or re research outside of their own sector. Now, the other polity in this region is the first Varger feudality, which their capital is Gaklonach. Varger civilization arose independently of other concentrations in known space, physiologically very similar to other Varger. Um... They're similar to other Bar Varger, but they have a strong pack defense me mentality focused on holding resources and management through strength. Structure-wise, they are spread throughout five bordering sectors, and their expansion has been stopped by natural stellar boundaries, in this case the desolation for this particular sector. They were uplifted by the ancients and seeded within this region of space. This group of Varger experimented with many different socio-political structures over time and stabled under a quasi stabilized under a quasi feudalistic competitive structure that limits their expansion because essentially they're so busy fighting themselves. Um, Military wise, uh, it's uh, largely focused on patronage by local sponsors, driving technological advancement and their constant arms races. This has put limitations in financing as per and has prevented much advancement beyond tech level 12. External relations. What external relations? They barely have any success with internal relations. They do pose a threat to the Mapedi, but stellar barriers and intense infighting make them certifiable. Uh, Gachlonak is located one sector rimward. Okay. So that summarizes what we did through the first two videos of our exploration of the sector construction construction guide. What we're going to do in this video is that the sector construction guide box set comes with a huge pad of world construction maps that you can tear off and include as part of an investigation into a particular world. And so what we're going to do here is we are going to produce the world transcendence okay and we are going to follow the basic guidelines that are involved here in the sector construction guide book that comes with this box set and so if i turn forward a little bit here we are at main world design. Now, one of the things that I love about Traveler is the Traveler is made by intelligent, learned individuals. And so if you really want to go gonzo with Traveler, as in like really getting into intense detail with things, uh, I would recommend Traveler 5. And Traveler 5 is like graduate level thesis engagement with <laughs> creation of... Um, uh, stellar cartography. Um, there's a little, there are little hints of it here in the sector construction guide. You get a section on star properties, which allows you to, uh, determine the temperature of a star, the habitable zone distance, uh, the length of its year. And there are some examples down here, which it gives you star type which I believe these are based off of star types as defined by the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, uh, the mass of the star. And this is mass in terms of like, I think soul compared to soul. Okay. Um, and specifically soul would be considered a G type star under this scale. 
the radius of the star, its luminosity, how large its habitable zone is in astronomical units. So Earth, Earth's average distance from Sol is one astronomical unit. Okay, so this gives you um, uh, factors of uh, AU for a habitable zone. Um, 100D, I'm not as familiar with this, for main world, ah, okay, so this is for jump drive distances. So the 100D distance is the 100 times the diameter of the uh, star, in, well, let me make sure I get it right. Da -da. The 100 D value in this table is based on a star's mass, not diameter. My bad. So this is a multiple of mass um, in terms of what the distance is in AU. Uh, in other words, how far you need to be away from the gravity well of the star in order to be able to jump. And then how long a year is, how long it takes to orbit around the star once. And I'm going to skip over these details because we could go through many, many, many videos working with the sector construction guide. Um, but I think limiting it to a nice three gives you a really good taste of the system and you can work on all that stuff on your own. Now, here's a depiction of the map, sorts of things that you can do with the map. Uh, there's information on tidal factors, climate, moons and celestial objects, wildlife, pathogens. There's also social design details that you can work out here. Um, and there is a world summary sheet that you can do. Now, I'm not going to fill out the world summary sheet here because my intention here is to do more of a let's have fun coloring sort of situation. But note that this is another worksheet that you can use that comes with the sector construction guide. OK, so uh, one last thing that I just want to point out is that there is an example map here of the world of Avalar. OK, and so we are going to go off of this example right here now. Uh, notice that there are a lot of different colors on this map. That is not an issue for me at all, um, because I am rocking this Zebras Zensations 24 um, colored mechanical pencil set. And so I'm going to be using all the colors that are indicated on the maps that we see in the example map that we see here. And I'm going to label them just according to the example map. And so let's go ahead and dive in with what is happening here. So I'm going to start with red because in this example map here, both cities and uh, downports are indicated by red. And so I'm just going to go ahead and start by filling in where I would think major cities are located within the uh, location. And rather than drawing a hexagon here, which is a little difficult for me under these circumstances, I'm just going to do a red dot for uh, cities and then a red dot with, you know, a crosshairs for a starport. Um, and we'll go from there. And I'm, I'm just doing this randomly. I mean, the equator would be approximately here. And so perhaps for this world, we would, we would definitely have a city in each of the, uh, hemispheres. Um, and, uh, then a couple of cities along, uh, near to the equator or at least between the two tropics, as it were. That looks good. And then let's also get a starport uh, somewhat near to some of these cities. Let's have like a major, um, a major area located here where there are two cities, each within a hex of each other. And we will also draw a downport located right here. Okay? So there's that. Next. This is where it gets a little weird, I think. Okay. Um, but I have purple here, at least my closest approximation to purple that I have with colored pencils. It's maybe going to show up like a little bit pink, but this is native life. And for this, let's go ahead and write down what each of these represents. So we have native life, agriculture, desert. Now, the cool thing is that this map is adaptable. So I'm just writing down the examples that are present in the example, um, 
that I'm working off of in the book, but that doesn't mean that I couldn't label and key these any way that I wanted. You could have an entire uh, cyberpunk-esque giant city world if you really wanted to. Okay, glacier and rough terrain isn't going to be any different from mountains under these circumstances. Oh, there is a little bit of a difference there. And so, continuing on, let's get our colors in right here. So, agriculture will be in green. Uh, if you remember back to our sector guide, um, this was a water-based world, so there are going to be huge segments of the world that are water. And so I have blue right here. These are kind of darker primary colors that I got. These are emoti, uni emote uh, mechanical color pencils, if you want to check those out. Um, I recommend jet pens for the purchase of like really unique um, uh, very unique um, We'll do rough terrain here. Very unique uh, stationary products. Okay, so rough terrain's gonna be in this one right here. And I don't know if this is gonna be the case, but I'm gonna pull one of these pencils and see if I can get, this might, mountains might be, yeah, mountains are kind of gonna be like, kind of like a burnt orange umber. Okay. And then sea ice, we need a light blue. Or in this case, I'm going to do sky blue. Glacier will just leave white. And desert is going to be yellow. All right. Now, I'm just going to dive in. The idea here is to create a handout that uh, would allow my players to be able to think about, you know, like, what's going on with this situation? Like, uh, where might we want to go? Where where would there be key issues that we want to investigate? Um, and so um, I'm going to skip native life for now because I don't want to... Uh, uh, just, uh, overlay my map with a bunch of, um, purple. Okay. I expect this to be a life rich world. And so honestly, uh, under these circumstances, I would say that native life is nearly the entire, uh, location. One thing that I will do here though, is I'm going to, uh, block off where polar ice is located and we're going to make some sizable ice caps, on this planet. Now, remember what would happen here. What would happen is that all of these triangular sections would kind of get folded together three dimensionally to make a 3D map of a world. So this is just all indicating that this is the line that separates ice on the top. Um, and uh, unlike Earth, let's do a smaller example down below. Okay, so this will be a smaller uh, polar situation down below. Now we'll get some sea ice going, though. Okay. Yeah, this is looking good. Thins out a little bit right here in this glaciated area, and then it really expands over here. I'm just having fun right now. Okay, there isn't any rhyme or reason right now why I need to do something in a particular way, but you could get super specific with this. This is entirely up to you. You have freedom to decide what, design what you want, and you know different different people like uh, different um, creative expression in role playing games. So maybe drawing a map of a world for a science fiction role playing game isn't for you. But uh, it's definitely something that I'm interested in. We're going to make them a, the sea ice a little bit bigger. And one thing that I can see happening here is that since we have this city really close to sea ice, maybe this city's you know major um, uh, source of... I'll continue this at the exact correct hex that it needs to be at. Um, this city's maybe its major form of commerce is 
fishing for like Arctic mammals or something like that, or or uh, uh, using ridden Arctic mammals to get um, fish from these areas. And so here we are rocking all of our sea ice. I'm just going to color this in fully. If you are a fan of adult coloring books like I am, these mechanical pencils are also very, very useful for that as well. Are they the best quality pencil leads out there? No, but um, one of the biggest technological improvements that has happened in the writing industry uh, over the last several years has been uh, much more stable lead that have made colored mechanical pencils property. I'm not going to... Uh, possible. I'm not going to pretend like I know exactly um, what the change is, but anybody who's worked with colored pencil lead before knows that it tends to be a bit brittle. And so something has happened here that has allowed stabilization of these leads so that they could be used in mechanical pencil form instead of uh, wood case pencil form. And these are fully refillable too. You can buy refills for them. So there we go. We got all of our sea ice locked down. Now I think I'm going to start working on some of the continents that I want to work with. And I think I'm just going to outline continents in pencil. Okay. We're going to have one continent here. And you can draw whatever you want. Okay. So here's one continent. And both of the cities are kind of on the southern coast here. We have... Another continent that terminates in a fun point here. That's looking good. I'm liking that. Okay. And then some small land masses. you're curious, I'm rocking a Lamy 2000 mechanical pencil under these circumstances. And last continent located right here. These continents can continue on to the other side. And so let's go ahead and do this right here in case um, uh, spatial connections is something that's a little bit more difficult for you. This would go like this. And then it would come back, let's see, right here. Okay, so this continent is basically continued. Remember, if we were to fold this all together, this would become a three-dimensional world. Okay, so what do we do under these circumstances? Well, let's get our water in there. Now, this is a pretty dark blue. Okay, I will admit that. Um, uh, but I chose it, so I'm still going to rock with it here. And at least there would be a clear distinction between what we would consider to be uh, sea ice and water on this map. Um, I would maybe choose more of a royal blue under other circumstances. But you get the idea. Okay. So this will take me a little bit of time. And so you all can discuss quietly amongst yourselves. Here I'll give you a topic, socialism in Eastern Europe in the 20th century. Discuss. No, not so much. Okay. Um, here I'll give you another topic. Um, variation in desired outcomes for various role players throughout the world. That's a good topic for everybody to think about because, you know, if we think about it, there's been a lot of stuff going around right now of people acting like there's only one right way to play role-playing games, and that is just false. My hypothesis is that there are a lot of people out there who, for one reason or another, tie their identity to their hobbies, and when aspects of parts of the hobby that they love get challenged or questioned by people. They have a tendency to take it personally, even though it's not intended personally. And uh, then they lash out 
at what they view as an insult. Uh, I recommend a very great set of Hidden Brain podcasts that my buddy DJ uh, introduced me to. Um, they're Hidden Brain podcasts that you can check out on Honor Culture and how Honor Culture drives people to do completely illogical things in order to preserve their honor, which there is some honor culture everywhere, I would say. Um, but it's particularly concentrated in the American Midwest and in the American South. And uh, if you want an extreme example, and this is, to be fair, not hyperbole, okay, this does happen. Um, I kind of like the way that I'm coloring this because it almost looks like I'm getting like ocean currents in here, kind of. Um, so honor culture in its most extreme form uh, would be a situation where uh, somebody insults you and rather than just tolerating the insult or insulting them back, um, people resort to murdering people who insult them. <laughs> um, that is honor culture at its most extreme. So if you are a role player in the audience and you are interested in human psychology, um, oh yes, I'm getting a great color pencil line. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, if you're interested in human psychology, check out um, the Hidden Brain podcast on honor culture because I think it explains a lot of why some role players get like hyper upset when people disagree with them or do not play the way that they play um, and they take people playing differently from them personally as if it's a personal affront to them. But if you are, whether you are a new role player or a veteran role player in the audience, folks, I promise you, you can role play however you want. And so long as people at your table are okay with it, which, you know, there's something always to be said for communication in role playing games, then you can do whatever you want. I was having a great discussion uh, with uh, the Omega Dork recently uh, about... Um, uh, what were we talking about? Um, oh, God darn it. I lost it. Cut me some slack. It's between Christmas and New Year's. I check out during this time. I, I'm fortunate enough that I'm able to check out during this time. So, um, but we were having a great discussion about role playing and role playing psychology. And oh, um, so the Omega Derek and I are very much, um, you know, we like mechanics um, and we like to roll dice, but. Those things in the absence of a quality story um, or quality characterizations um, are not as interesting to us. You know, we want to confront interesting social, political situations in our games. We're not just playing role playing game to kill X thing and move on to Y thing. Um, I agree with the Omega Dork and many role players that I interact with on social media. Uh, when we say that it seems to us that like a lot of role players would just be happier if they were playing video games because they treat role playing games as if they are video games. It's all about like optimization of mechanics and um, much, much more focused on the, ele the elements of chance, which, as I said, you can do whatever you want, but you liking the elements of chance more doesn't mean that those elements are as liked by other people. And it also doesn't mean that your preference for mechanics should apply to the entire hobby. Okay. A lot of people take over this like possessive, um, take on things where they're like, this is my hobby. And people who belong in my hobby should do what I like. I mean, that's basically gatekeeping is what that is. Um, and a lot of people have been misusing the term gatekeeping recently to mean anything that they don't like. <laughs> um, but that's not the definition of what gate gatekeeping is. Gatekeeping is preventing or making it difficult for somebody to participate in a hobby because of their particular likes or dislikes. So a classic example of gatekeeping in role playing is that if someone has a particular uh, aspect 
of them that is important to their identity and people pretend like that component of their identity doesn't exist or shouldn't exist at a gaming table, that is a form of social gatekeeping. Okay. If this applies to you, I hate to be the one to describe it to you, but um, whenever you say things like, I don't want any politics in my gaming, well, you're basically gatekeeping out anybody who likes to tell stories that have politics in them. And you may not like to tell stories that have politics in them, but all stories have politics, whether you recognize it or not. And so it's, it's just a modern way in which people have been very sneaky about gatekeeping without while being able to have plausible deniability as if they are not gatekeeping people. But, you know, folks, we're not stupid. We know what you're doing. Okay. So, you know, think of ways to encourage people to participate in at a table with you. And if you're going to have hard stops, like we don't have any hard, uh, any politics at our table, that's fine. You can do that but you are preventing the available pool of individuals who could be at your table. And if you're okay with that, or if you're in a situation where that isn't an issue for you, fine, but it isn't exactly endearing to those of us who are more welcoming to a wide variety of different identities at our table. Okay. I, I think some of you, um, some role players are uh, claim themselves to be, nicer than they actually are. Um, and that's where we could draw a line between niceness and kindness. Being nice and being kind are not the same thing. You can be nice and be unkind. That would be like you're being polite, but in reality, your actions are actually really unkind to people. Um, so yeah, in my eyes, we can all get better. We can all be more welcoming and more people. And um, experiencing social challenge when you are preventing people from participating in, a, in a, a hobby is a you problem, not other people problem. And I know that there are members of this audience who will agree with that. And there may be some members of this audience who will disagree with that. And it's okay to disagree. Just disagree respectfully. Okay. Um, I don't allow dehumanizing language in my comments section, okay? And so whether you realize that the language that you're using is dehumanizing or not is not an excuse in my book. So just uh, play nice and you get to comment. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can disagree kindly. That is a possibility. If we just have a dif difference of opinion, that's fine. But having a difference of opinion where it's like, I respect people's humanity and you don't, that is not a difference of opinion that I jam with. So, you know, maybe this is not the channel for you. If, if that doesn't sound good to you, you should move on to another channel. But that's part of the reason why I like Traveler as well. Traveler really encourages people to explore the nuances of culture and politics. And that's not the only way you can play Traveler, but it's really easy to do that in Traveler. And I'm in a little bit of a problem here in that I'm running out of lead in this one. And I don't know if I have replacement leads <laughs> for this. Um, so I'm just in an unfortunate situation here where I picked a color where, where I just ran out of it. So that's going to be that. Um, you get the idea. You can see where there's, where there's water here. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm out of lead on this particular pencil. Um, let's see if I have a dark enough blue on this um, Pentel Multi-8. I might have a darker, dark enough blue on this Pentel Multi-8. No, nope, that's not it. Mm, oh, we got to move the lead back. Okay. Now let's try it. Nope. That's my orange. Mm, we got to get this retracted back into the orange section. There we go. Okay. So we're going to retract this back into the orange section and then switch to blue. No, we're back to orange. No. Okay. Kind of see what I've done here. I 
had moved the orange right where the blue was. Okay, now the orange is back in the orange section, I think. And we're going to switch to blue. And just the blue should come out here. Oh, that's the light blue. I am all turned around here. So clearly I got to recalibrate this in some way, shape, or form. No, that's the light blue. Or maybe that's as blue as I get, actually. <laughs> that might that might be as blue as I get, because this is the... Oh, there's green. So clearly this whole thing is a little messed up right now. And so I need to uh, recalibrate this. And so, you know, we're just going to leave it for right now, because I don't want to make this video too long. But uh, let's get into some mountain ranges, okay? Our mountain ranges are kind of this burnt sienna color. No, that's not it. This one. And so we're going to say that there's some plate tectonics going on here. So I'm going to create a mountain range wherever I sort of feel like that there would be a convergent boundary going on. Okay. So we have a convergent boundary here. And we'll put a convergent boundary right on the edge right here. And let's say we're moving towards the uh, ice in the southern pole with a convergent boundary here. I would say that the ice is moving towards this continent. Yeah, mountain ranges. Okay. Desert. Let's say that there is a mid-latitudes desert located sort of right along the equator here because you know we want to try to make it quasi realistic I mean we could go into deep detail on this I am highly anticipating the world construction guidebook which should be releasing in January coming up here mongoose if you're listening <laughs> I would love to showcase that product for people on the channel. Okay, so there we have a desert. Uh, agriculture. Well, it stands to reason that there would be agricultural lands around where cities are located. Now, once again, we're going to get into this situation where I picked two dark colors, unfortunately. <laughs> so here we have agricultural land all surrounding this city down here. And remember that agriculture can mean a lot of things. Just because this is at a lower latitude doesn't mean that you can't have agriculture. But we'll have a huge agricultural area in this continent. I mean, obviously, if I were to do this again, I would choose lighter colors. My bad, folks. I'm sort of going by the... quasi-randomness here. Okay, so eh, let's extend this down into here as well. This, this whole area looks like it's ripe for agricultural pursuits for this particular group. So one thing that I've been thinking that's very interesting to think about for with regards to transcendence is, you know, what sort of scientific exploration would people pursue under these circumstances? Uh, there's obviously the black hole, which is the key feature that I determined for this area. But then we can also consider... Um, would some people choose the science of agriculture to continue feeding the population? Because expansion doesn't really seem like it's a, um, a goal for people. Or would they be into mycology, growing mushrooms or something? That seems like it would be cool. 
you know, if I were to do another color here, I'd probably do like grasslands or plains or something like that. I'd go heavier into a biome would, would probably be my thought, um, for this. Um, that's the beauty of it. You can do whatever you want under these circumstances, but we'll at least get some agricultural areas in here. And then, you know, if, you know, let me know in the comments what you would do under these circumstances to fill out your map of transcendence. Now, my hope would would be for me to get this player ready, but I'm not going to get it entirely player ready uh, at this moment. But that's OK, because I'm just do, doing this video to show off to you all what's possible with the sector construction guide. And you can feel free to take over in any way, shape or form that you want. Let's get some just agriculture up here. Okay. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. I mean, I, you know, I don't like dark colors by dark colors, but that's my bad. Okay. I mean, if I were to include anything else here, I'd get like a, probably a light green and we'd, we'd throw some grasslands in here because we don't, we don't, we, we want our GIS map to be appropriately gis <laughs> Global Information System. Yeah, let's get some, let's rock some grassland around here. Grassland. So who knows, maybe there's some recreation associated with the grasslands in this continent. Um, yeah, we can do grasslands for the rest of this. Because the idea here is just to have a forward facing, a player facing, I should say, map that they can look at and interpret, sort of decide what they want to investigate. You could have a GM version of this a referee version of this. I'm sorry, we're dealing with Traveler here. Um, you could have a referee version of this in which um, uh, it's it's not GIS. And so, you know, my, maybe my referee version wouldn't have all the color that you see here, but would indicate things like points of interest. You could have a political GIS map in which, um, now it wouldn't really apply, apply, I don't think, here for transcendence. But the idea here is that you would have different types of maps to suit different purposes. Um, and then our last little continent here, we'll have some grasslands that we'll throw in. And then we'll have more of a complete map to work off of. Ooh, I had an idea. Maybe this altar, maybe this, uh, this point up here is just a, is just very, well, that's rough terrain. Let's go with mountainous terrain. This is all mountainous terrain surrounding the city. And you know, you, we just come up with a reason as to why people settled there. Um, yeah, we can say that it counts as agricultural because maybe they're, you know, the, their, their agriculture doesn't have to be wheat fields. Okay. It can be anything that we want it to be that's agricultural. It could be animal husbandry could be what's going on in different locations. And so, you know, maybe there are intergalactic cattle being raised, but there we go. There's transcendence. Now notice that there are other things that you could do here. Okay. You can have UWP codes for your particular, um, for, for your particular world that you have. Um, there's lots of different possibilities. So here's more of the royal blue that I was looking for. So we'll just finish up the ocean here in royal blue, get it to blend together so that we have sort of a quasi finalized version. And then I'll just explain to my players, I made an oopsie. <laughs> I ran out of this other color. And so I had to continue with the different blue, my bad. 
But as you can see, everybody likes to color. I say that to my students. Okay, maybe you don't like to color, and that's fine. You like what you like. Coloring! Yay! Rock and roll. So, yeah, the Sector Construction Guide is available uh, from uh, Mongoose Publishing's website. I will post a link in the description below so that if you want to check that out, you can. If you missed uh, video one and video two for the for this series, um, I'm going to try to get a playlist together that I will post um, on all of the prior videos, so that you can go to them and you know use this as either inspiration or a how-to guide, whatever you want to use it for for adding depth to your traveler worlds. But there we go. There's transcendence. Okay, the home world of the Mapetti humans. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you to Mongoose for supplying the sector construction guide so that I could do these videos. And hey, whatever you like to make as an RPG enthusiast, you build stuff. Building stuff is fun. Have a great day, everybody. Bye bye.